A long time ago, a young engineer decided that he should write a manifesto of purpose. That manifesto of purpose was within the walls of Chevrolet Division at General Motors. And as I understand it, that initial memo has almost spot on. I could, I could read it, but it would sound as if it was something out of the twilight zone because it was so spot on to the particular point where we are in the industry today with a number of aftermarket parts, and the availability of those parts, factory commitment, and it was all written from a young engineer who simply wanted to do his job better. And that job was attempting to lead some portions of the engineering staff in special projects. And it, en it encompassed all sorts of things about performance of Chevrolet vehicles, how they stood in the marketplace, and where they fit and where they should fit up to present day time. A young engineer again today has been given the task of writing a similar letter, a manifesto of purpose. That young man's name is McPhail. And he has been given the manifesto of purpose target to write, quote, another Duntoff letter, unquote. I would like to say several things about this man but most of you already know a great deal about this man. The interviewer will be Jim McFarlane. These fellows have been friends for, I don't know, 26, 7, 8, 30 years. And they've always been very close on projects, and we thought it specifically appropriate that we have opportunity to listen to a conversation of history, of presence, and of future. So if you will, all we're going to do is eavesdrop. Zora Arcus Duntoff, as interviewed by Jim McFarlane. About oh, early 1950, and as I recall, you were working for and had driven for the Allard Company in England. And in fact, you'd been in one Le Mans race in an Allard and were approaching a second. And there was a, there was a general of the armies in England who was a friend of yours who had also purchased some Allards. Do you recall his name? Uh, general Griswold. General Griswold. Yeah. And if I recall correctly, General Griswold was also a friend of Ed Cole, yeah. who was the president of Chevrolet. Chief engineer. Chief engineer. And you had indicated perhaps an interest, and he had suggested, General Griswold, that you should have an interest in maybe coming to work for Chevrolet. Is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> Don't be too modest. Yeah. Okay, so. Long story short, you wound up uh, deciding that coming to the United States might be a better place to live than in England. Elfie certainly thought so. Yeah. And so you eventually came to work for Chevrolet. Yes. Uh, but you were only a couple of weeks away from your second race at Le Mans in an Allard. How did Chevrolet feel about that? Who, my you, were, you were going to another Le Mans race in an Allard while you were now working for Chevrolet. Well. Sticky. Sticky. Uh, my boss, Maurice Orly, dead set against us. I asked to take the uh, chief engineer at call, and maybe hour or maybe hour and a half. Ed Cole dissuaded me, but I, I, I pr promised to uh, uh, drive the race and no way back. So you went? But I went. 
Okay. Then you came back to Chevrolet to go to work. And shortly thereafter, I believe it was in December of 53, was when you wrote the infamous memo yeah. that Harold's referring to. Um, why don't you share with us what happened after you wrote that memo? Nothing happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nothing happened. Nothing happened. Okay. But you made a statement, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, first, I was uh, employed by research and development, working for Maurice Oli. And at that time, I have interest, uh, uh, particular interest to Corvette and took uh, this uh, assignment without any uh, thought what will come from this. Um, Fuel injection came along there too pretty quickly, didn't it? Uh, no, not so quickly. <laughs> <laughs> not so quickly. Uh, but you did begin working with some of the early Corvettes. In fact, you mentioned you had one, a 53, that had the wooden grill? Or the yeah, yeah, one of three built, pre-test, and my car has a wooden grill, imitation of uh, paint silver. Uh, and on this car, I developed uh, suspension component change, Rear spring uh, inclination, two degree, uh, two degree positive caster in front, remove excessive understeer from rear, and uh, uh, remove oversteer in front. So you continued working with a small block. Uh. Okay. Uh, Small block, uh, it was um, originally it was thought to be 255 engine. Mm -hmm. and, and while uh, uh, working for GM, I was interested in, in engine. And uh, I sell at um, call. He was a brilliant, intuitive engineer. Uh, a 55 engine bearing cannot be, be, uh, can, uh, bearing. This was when the Moraine 400 series came. Yeah. And um, Moraine Mor Mor 400 did not help. Still, main bearing did not hold. Then, Ed Call decided to groove on the upper part of your bearing. And that feature stayed until today. It's a, Groove on the upper part of the bearing and uh, full bearing, bottom bearing. And I don't know any engine exists than uh, our small block Chevrolet. And the valve train came from Pontiac? Yeah. Okay, this is 1955. Let's jump over here to a little anecdotal situation for a second. Um, you were responsible for, after the Pikes Peak race that year, developing a certain performance levels for a couple of 55, 56 disguised small blocks, and you and Elfie came to Pikes Peak. Yeah. Um, you want to describe that covert effort you had going there, how you were disguising what was going on? Well, uh, our advertising agency in sales decided I should play a role of a 
crazy millionaire. <laughs> and I moved Broadmoor. At that time, it was very luxurious. At the Broadmoor? Broadmoor, okay. yeah. And I live up to the hills. <laughs> Uh, uh, bottle of wine every night at dinner and by the pool and pool uh, planter punch in the pool. <laughs> um, but you were up at three o'clock in the morning every morning. Yeah. With Elfie. Three o'clock. Yeah. Actually, two o'clock. I don't know. But to be on the uh, on the starting line to. Uh, to, for Pius Peak, sitting, shivering, um, Elfie and Al Rogers. Al Rogers was a, a, a four-time win uh, Pike Peak race, a, a champion car. They said in the brown bush, headline, Toward the uh, uh, toward the starting line, and I'm uh, sitting in, in the starting line, and I'm waiting when the high uh, um, uh, appearance to the daylight. I watch my, uh, watch my uh, headlight disappearing. Then I go, okay. At that time. All the tourists was already in Pike's Peak. So Alfie's up or halfway up the hill watching for people coming down while you're going up. Yeah. And uh, and the reasoning was if uh, if I encounter uh, okay. If they, they uh, spotted tourists coming down, then full bore, they descending toward the starting line, and I'm already in, in full bore climbing. And what reason was to do that, I did not know. That didn't make any sense. Collision. Uh, uh, but th that was the uh, uh, arrangement. But if I remember that the object was that you were, you were going out early in the morning, yeah. testing and setting up these cars for a period of five weeks, in fact, and then you yeah. and Elfie would come back down, hide the cars locally, go back yeah. to the Broadmoor and be playboys the rest of the day. Right, That's right. That's what I thought, okay. And, um. and by the way, uh, my expense account was rejected. <laughs> <laughs> Simply engineer and entertainment? No, no, no. <laughs> okay, let's leapfrog over something here. There's been a lot of talk over, over the years about the Duntop camshaft. Um, if I recall correctly, that really originally came from the work you did with the Arden Heads. Yeah. And it was an asymmetrical lobe. Yeah. Very quick opening, very slow closing, and yeah. you simply took that that concept into a cam for the small block Chevrolet. Right. What was the reception by Chevrolet engineers when you did that? <coughs> um, the, 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 uh, don't have cam, it never work. <laughs> <laughs> so no acceptance. And I, um, and I uh, sat in Arizona in preparation for um, a speed, a speed run in Daytona Beach. And I know I lacked maybe 20 horse, horses to reach uh, 150 miles average. And uh, like waiting like a cat on the tin roof and calling uh, Detroit. Uh, my uh, camshaft is ready, send me. They are ready, but we have to run and dyno. What makes sense to run a dyno? If the camshaft work, 
That's all right. If not worth, my name is mud and... <laughs> well, fortunately it was work. <laughs> Guess what happened? Yeah. Okay. Um, later on in your, in, your, uh, in your career, the early career there, into the 50s, and if I recall, the, the W engine, the 348, became your responsibility. And the, the small block as we knew it then had pretty much been maxed out, and it was time to do some big block work. And that was your project. And uh, yeah. Buck Baker entered in that somewhere, I think, was it not? Uh, okay. Uh, in the summer of 58, I got, uh, I was on vacation, and I get a call from uh, Rosenberger. He was assistant chief engineer. And tell me that Ed Cole like to you to develop a W engine, our track engine, racing engine. Okay, I, I uh, shot my um, uh, vacation back to Detroit. Oh no. Then uh, he also tell me visiting with uh, Buck Becker. It's the father of t t today, Becker. Uh, at, at Trenton Speedway. Okay, I see the grandstand in the uh, um, and uh, Trenton. He said someone was going to meet you there, right? Yeah. Okay. And soon, uh, uniform man, uh, mechanic uniform, but clean, uh, uh, sat uh, uh, along me and asked for light. I give him light. And uh, he said, well, uh, try to follow me, but not, uh, not right away. Keep me inside and follow me. I did. Uh, outside of the grandstand was a car. Door open, and I sat in the back seat. And uh, car. Uh, maybe 100 yards away, stop. And then uh, Buck Baker climbed the car and we discussed how we'll do that. Like uh, he will run the car and uh, everything that's broken, I will be replacing with better part and, and uh, Speedy Thompson poked his nose and back, uh, back introduced me. That's Mr. Brown. And you were Mr. Brown. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, Speedy, like, <laughs> chin. <laughs> but, okay, that was uh, mid uh, 58. Uh, engineering was not involved, sales was involved, and I get $25,000 from sale. And for this $25,000, I buy five cars. And, and distribute them to people that I see fit. These are, grand, these are NASCAR drivers. Car yeah, teams. yeah, right. yeah. And uh, Jim Ratman was assisting me. And we're sitting in, in the Miami, 
and telephone and Jim uh, calling each driver, uh, explain. And I listened to the other uh, side and if I feel that his response was enthusiastic or I said, or not enthusiastic. Okay, we get five drivers that, that were the backbacker and uh, Jim Reed, short truck driver. Curtis Turner? No. Curtis Turner? Curtis, I think, uh, Curtis Turner and Jim uh, and Weatherly, Joe Weatherly. But I'm not sure because he, uh, whatever, a five, uh, five driver and heavy duty part supplied by Jim Rackman. And as the racing fraternity go, uh, uh, Jim Smith, not that. Another driver, NASCAR driver, he know that five cars uh, mm, switching uh, to Chevrolet, and also he has a uh, uh, desire to buy a Chevrolet. And I explain uh, Jack Smith, his was name, and. Uh, Sixth car, uh, car, but he bought it with his own money. And when he found out that uh, the other driver get car for free, and he was uh, pay his his money, I don't know how I can do, uh, get you. Uh, reasoned with him, but uh, at any rate, he was a sixth car having. Um, it was opening uh, Daytona, and um, two preliminary races. I think one, two, three Chevrolet. And second preliminary is one, two, three Chevrolet. It's terrific. And uh, Daytona 500, the, all six car on the pole, but all six car has a chain, more chain driving camshaft, failing, failing. And I find out that although structurally Morse chain was much better, and the reason that they select Morse chain, but link chain was m more flexible. And since they, one day, all the Chevrolet was running on the link ch chain. And uh, uh, following uh, 60, Junior Johnson driving with one day uh, uh, uh Overall NASCAR championship was, was Chevrolet, Rex White. Well, those engines really were the outgrowth of the 348, which you turned into the 409. Yeah. And then, yeah. And which pretty much culminated that period. But again, you'd maxed out the W engine, and so the Porcupine head came next. And that was about the time you were responsible for most of their racing activities, were you not? Yeah. I was responsible for racing activity until uh, 1991 and 92. And after that, Vince Piggins, maybe 
you know him, will speak and took over a racing activity. And uh, he was responsible for drag racing long before that. Uh, like uh, Z11 at uh, Vince uh, and um, Let's go back and, and just briefly take a look at some of your involvement with the Corvette. Uh, you've been credited for an awful lot of its development, a lot of its progress. Um, while you did get involved early on with the Corvette, you didn't really become that immersed in it until into the 60s, as I recall, late 50s, early 60s. Uh, I was director of high performance in, in uh, 63. But then uh, I was uh, chassis and engine for Corvette. Simply uh, developing engine for Corvette and then a year later it, uh, pieces appear in the passenger car. It's like uh, like trial, a trial. Yeah. Well, coming on up more to, to more recent times, uh, you retired in seventy five. Seventy five. Yeah. And prior to that time, about your, your last major effort with the Corvette was 74, I believe. In fact, you had so, a 74. Yeah. Uh, which I think maybe you recently, you sold the car. Yeah. Offer you couldn't refuse, I believe yeah, you said. Yeah. yeah. Can you imagine? Um, I, you said a couple of things recently that I think are bear, bear mentioning. Your involvement with the Corvette all those years, while it was, it was your job, um, you were engineering it, you were directing it, there, but it was a youth-oriented, basically, vehicle. And you had some reasons why you stayed involved with the Corvette, besides just corporate reasons. What rather, that, that was my interest, to provide peace Why Corvette? to pass passenger car. All cylinder head design uh, in Corvette evolves uh, aluminum head, uh, large valve, uh, flow bench testing, and uh, uh, I think uh, 327 engine has all, uh, all complement of uh, my uh, contribution to engine, small block engine. As a intake was one, uh, one, uh, one uh, sorry, two inches and uh, Zero two and exhaust one point six, and then. Well, of all the small block displacements that you worked with, yeah, which would you say were the one or two most efficient displacement versus output? Three o two and three twenty seven. Well, you mentioned something else recently about. You're concerned about the hot rodders, and the Corvette gave them something to work on. It gave them something to work for, toward, in owning. And so there was some concern besides just selling cars about youth activities. Yeah. Uh, that's something I don't think has come to the, to the forefront, which kind of gets us up more contemporary. You've seen a number of things at this conference. Uh, you've consulted quite a bit around the world since you retired in 74. Um, we've talked a little about computers and electronics. Can you share some of your feelings about where we are now and what's going to be needed in the near and long term? Well, listening to SEMA presentation, I think 
everybody should scratch their head. <laughs> By the way, I uh, attend one le le lecture here. It's a perfect circle. Yeah, perfect circle. And I l l listen. Seal and, power? Huh? Seal power? Talk about the piston ring? Yeah. The seal power? Seal, seal power, okay. not per perfect circle. Okay. Close. Close. <laughs> By the way, I don't know who either seal power or um, another outfit. Molly, Molly ring, piston ring. Well, the small block started out with that. The, huh? the Molly top ring was in small block VH Chevy very early. Yeah. Right. But I introduced that. Uh, you were the one that started that. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. Now, while listening to to, uh, to interesting presentation, cross my um, thought crossed my mind back in uh, uh, six, uh, four, uh, 41 <laughs> 41 midget I know major driver and he related me story uh, before uh, but preliminary heat, he, uh, fa fa uh, by the name of Len Wufsi, and he was last. And, and by being the last, also he broke a piston. Same time was as premium, ran out to Reckon Yard and looking for a v, 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 uh, V860 piston and find one and with rings. He showed in the, in the engine and was ready to race, and that was inverted start. He was leading the race, and nobody passed him. Um, he won the race, championship race, and at that time, uh, Speed Sports new, News was very small publication, if any. And he, in the winter, he st started track from New Jersey, uh, down south, and every time he saw winning midget. Winning midget, the uh, one championship. He sold it, then <laughs> round up some <laughs> another wreck, uh, sold second. <laughs> Uh, uh, winning midget. I don't know how many mid midget he sold. But <laughs> <laughs> well, what are the what are the plans for Zora now? I like to say age gracefully, but <laughs> you know. <laughs> okay, thank you.